remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. Normally, of course, before we uh, begin to build an altar, regardless of how simple as this one or how elaborate we may have made them, we always uh, say our prayers and pour libation and ask for the presence of our ancestors so that they can guide our hands in constructing our tribute to them. Uh, and I say we because it is the organization, Adasi, the ancestor the uh, African Diaspora Ancestor Commemoration Institute, which is what ADASI stands for. And if I may add, at this point, if I can have my sisters who represent ADASI please stand so you all can see who they are. And Carla in the back, that's the baby back there. We are very pleased uh, and we are more than honored to have uh, Sister S. Pearl Sharp here with us this evening as you all premiere here her film because I don't think that you all have seen this film previously. And we are very grateful to Sankofa and our dear brother Hailey for making this venue possible so that we could also share it with you all and at no cost. So one of the things I'm going to ask you at the end is if you all, this is Sister Pearl's book. And this is a video. It's a CD. A CD, I'm sorry. The video's in the back. A CD, and she has the videos of the film. Now, you know, some places what we do is we require that as your entrance. <laughs> so I'm putting that out there for the sister now. Why? Because she's an independent filmmaker, as is Hailey. And as you all know, the struggle that we had in terms of trying to get Sankofa out so that the world could see what was really necessary for us to be able to try to begin some of the healings for ourselves that that struggle continues for us. And we have a sister now who is in attempting to uh, put forth her perspective on how we do some of that kind of healing. So as we begin, uh, I would like to invite you all uh, to join us as we pour libation to officially begin our program. Um, I'm going to just pour libation with uh, with water. And Sister Pearl is going to assist me with the, uh, with the bell, because you know, now, one of the things that we do in terms of bringing our ancestors, it's not always somber, because you know, now I know you had an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, or somebody who loved to party. So we just have to invite them to come and party with us tonight. Now some of what we're going to deal with is going to cause emotional kinds of things and to cause you to emote because it's necessary because we officially, as a people, have not acknowledged the damage that has been done to us for the last 400 years because it has not stopped. And so what we are trying to do with the Dossi is help us find ways in which we can reach into ourselves and begin some of the healing process because it has to, it will continue because every day we're continue to be experience more trauma. So it, it doesn't stop. And it's not where you're healed one time and you keep going. So at this point in time, I'm going to pour libation in Yoruba. I know in DC, most everybody is used to doing so in a, in a tree for a Khan people, but I follow the tradition of Ifa, which is the, pe the Yoruba people. So we shall do that. And I'm going to try to do some translation so that there is a better understanding of what we are actually doing when we pour the libation. Mm -hmm. Libation is non-denominational. And it's a way in which we call the positive energy forces of the universe to be with us and to help open the way and to clear the way so that no negativity comes in. So we don't have to worry about anybody fighting and arguing and all that sort of thing, but rather that we are enlightened and uplifted by the presence of positive energy in our ancestors. So as I say, Mojuba Aye, Mojuba Arun. What I am saying at that point is I give honor to Mother Earth and Father Sky. I say, Omi Tutu, Ile Tutu, Ona Tutu. Tutu Eshu, Tutu Ogun, Tutu Obatala, Tutu Shango, Tutu Yemenja, Tutu Oya, Tutu Oshun, Tutu Arunale, Tutu Orisha. 
Mojuba Olorun, Mojuba Olofi, Mojuba Olodumare. And if I may stop first, I said Mojuba, I gave honor and praise to those forces of the universe that assisted God with creation of the universe and called them by the names that we here upon this earth try to understand them. And they are not only the energy forces of like wind and sun and rain and fresh water and so on and so forth, but they also are the concepts that had to exist for the universe to be created, like the concept of good and prosperity and justice and righteousness. Then I said, Omi Tutu, I said, Mojuba Olorun, Mojuba Olofi, Mojuba Oladumare. Three names that we call God in Yoruba, the owner of the universe, maker of all creation, owner of all of the heavens. Mojuba Ibaye Egum Bobo Egum Yabaye. Mojuba Babalurisha, Ilurisha, Lurua. Mojuba Bobo Iku, and Belezi Oladumare Ibaye Oru. Kinkamashe Asheda Ashe. Kinkamashe Akoda Ashe. Kinkamashe Babalao Adejuando Okundaye Ashe. And before I ask for our final blessing, I would ask each one of you to call upon your ancestors that their presence would be here. I have called for our general ancestors, as I said, Mojuba Egun, which means ancestors, the good ancestors, because in the Yoruba tradition, one can only become an ancestor if you live a life of good character. Okay. So I ask you to call your ancestors, like Marcus Garvey, and Amy Jacques Garvey, Ashe, 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 Ashe. We call you one. We call you all. All of you who are of good character and who wish us well. All of you who have labored and struggled for the upliftment of African people from the beginning of this time and to today. All of you who have lo were lost in the middle passage. Yeah. We yeah. pray for you and uplift you. Yeah. As we say, Kosi Iku, Kosi Aron, Kosi Afro. Yeah. Kosi Fatibu, yeah. Kosi Adina, yeah. Kosi Efa. Yeah. Ariku Babawa, yeah. Ariku Mamawa, yeah. Ashe. Yeah. I have just said, let us not see death, our mother. Let us not see death, our father. Let us not see confusion. Let us not see poverty. Let us not go without anything. And as I say in Yoruba, Ashe, which means, and so let it be, I ask you to repeat. Ashe, 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 Ashe. And I thank you all for participating. And as we get ready to begin our film, I would ask Brother Hiley if he would come forth and introduce our filmmaker. And, and our other stars are here. If you all will come in and have some refreshments and come in. Ackland's here. You can come in anyway. Ackland. I said our stars. Ackland, you too. Come on. Mama Kabibi, you all do know Mama Kabibi. Get in. Come on in. Mama Kabibi is. Baba Ackland, she's eating already. And Brother Ackland Lynch. For those of you who do not know Mama Kabibi, as I've just talked about, our struggle as a people of African descent, still trying to find ourselves, still trying to heal ourselves. This sister is, I don't know, that I can't never get the official title right, but she's in charge of the National Organization of NCOBRA, the National Coalition for Blacks, of Blacks for Reparation in America. So this is Mama Kabibi. All right, come on, Ashley. Thank you, Ndai. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody um, for coming out today. Uh, I know it's usually Saturday is very difficult for a lot of people, 
in the new uh, new millennium, but we uh, dare to want to occupy your Saturday evening uh, with a special sister from California. Uh, by the way, most of the people here are the people who are the original Sankofa family All right. that unleashed the <laughs> film into the world. All right. And the uh, main priest is here trying to pull his uh, teeth out, eating the wrong food. <laughs> Just act your age, man. <laughs> eating difficult things here. <laughs> so that's Agla Lynch. Yeah, who went to Randy Weston's event at his place? Don't we want to have it again? Yes. yes. Who's going to be next? Should be Acklin. Yes. Huh? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, the sister I want to introduce today, I don't want to go into her resume. You, should, you guys should go into the internet. She's all over the place there. In fact, when Gloria put her on the radio, when I called her about the event, uh, she just researched so much. She said, D "You know, this is I need hour. You know, an hour show. It's not like brief situation here because she's been an actress, director, producer, organizer, poet, essayist. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, aware of her work. But I knew when I was a student. I'm not younger than her, but." Uh, she started out young in the industry, so we used to see her on commercials at least. And we say, did you see the sister who was in that commercial? Is how we started. First time I knew her, and then Barbara, who did Bush Mama with me, and who did Child of Resistance with me, introduced me there, the, you know, good friends. And um, for us here at Sankofa, to sponsor our sister is very, very important and special for me. And I want to thank Adasi for being the footwork, the soldiers, the organizers. Um, on top of that, it's, well, it's also about the issue of spiritualism. And since I'm sure by now you know there's an amazing thing going on. Uh, African descendants all over the place, from here to Brazil, uh, to um, South Africa, to London. I have even emails just from London to Norway. Black people are repositioning their spiritual dynamics. It's an amazing era we live in. Yeah. You know. And sometimes I, I, I say to myself, why didn't I live on such such period? But no, 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 this one is interesting. <laughs> this one is interesting because, you know, it's an amazing spiritual repositioning of black people that we are witnessing. And again, it's not a simple repositioning. There are people who will fall out, but it's going to redefine the gold. The jewel is going to emerge, and I think uh, our struggle is not in vain. That's what we can see in this era. And... Our sister Sharp, we call her, I call her, you know, for me, she's like Madame Dignity. You know, the way she carried herself, you know, in, in, in acting. It's not, diff it's not easy to want to be an actor in America and be black. The kind of pr part they only know they to give you. And the sister to keep her dignity always has been my impression, my, my inspiration. I always felt when I was a student at UCLA, she stood her ground. Parts that make sense she took. It was not a desperate, because most black actors are desperate people. They will do anything. Even against what they used to say. They will go replay what they were against. And so this whole stereotype, uh, characters would not be played if there was a lot of many Sister Dignity, like Sister Sharp here, who would say, I don't want this part. I could, I could write poetry and live and, you know, uh, things like that. She's trying to cut me short. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, for us, uh, Gloria, did you? I heard. Uh, I heard it. By the way, Hi. that's her now. That's her. That was okay. terrorizing you on the radio. <laughs> you know, she's our calendar. She yeah. keeps the community on, in, you know, on pulse. Uh, yeah. and otherwise, you don't hear about us. You know, the Washington Post will put us to have our sister coming here. She should be all over the post, but this is our post, Sister Gloria. Thank you again thank you very, very, very much. much. And so I want her to introduce the film. Uh, I feel awkward because I'm in it. She considers me elder, which is really something we have to work out tonight <laughs> when, when we go to bre <laughs> break breads. But anyway, I want her to introduce the film, and then we start the film. We sh you finish the film, and there will be discussion with question and answer and presentation. Again, 
Thank you, and thank you for coming, my sister. Thank you, I am so honored to be here in Sankofa at last. I've been hearing about the store since Heidi first opened it, and to finally be here at last. And my thanks to the Adasi sisters, who were going to have this in October. And then when I said I had to be in here for something else in September, they pulled it off. So we are here tonight. The Healing Passage, Voices from the Water, started out as a short half-hour film about one of the first artists you will meet, Ryua Akinshigan. She does an art installation on the Middle Passage, and she asks the question when people walk into it, did you lose anybody in the Middle Passage? And if your answer is yes, and trust me, some people think that they did not, so then they take them aside and they talk to them. Uh, <laughs> but if you say yes, then you get a little doll with an assignment, and you go into the installation, and you do your assignment. The first time I saw it, it, I missed it the first time it was up, but then I saw it in her home, and I said, this has to be documented. And so I thought I was doing this half-hour piece on her, and apparently the ancestors had something else in mind, because ten and a half years later, the film was finally finished, and there are 12 featured artists in it, plus additional artists, and it's a 90-minute piece. So the, you know where the bathrooms are, if you have to get, <laughs> there's still food out there. Make yourselves comfortable, enjoy, and we will come back and dialogue. What I like to do as the lights come down and as the film starts is I'd like you to just call out loud the names of your ancestors and just keep that going until the film actually comes up on the screen. Asante. Because there is much, I mean, I can't go through this without feeling the pain. And I'm saying I um, taught a, a class called uh, Introduction to Africa and the African Diaspora at Morgan for about 10 years or more, as long as Sankofa has been out. I use Sankofa every semester. And every time I see Sankofa, I cry. Yeah. And every time I go through it, so I know that I still have pain that I haven't been able to deal with. And I think that most of us do, and I don't think we see this film without sensing what we still need to do for our ancestors. Not the pain is still there, we have to work through it. And so I just want to ask each one of you for a moment to just turn to the next person who might be your brother, who might be your sister, but we know that we are related in some way, and say I love you. And we have gone through this together, and that we shall survive it together and that we shall be moved through it, and that we shall be uplifted by our experiences. Ashe. So you got this high? Yeah. yeah. OK, well, I'll tell you this. Uh, I know you got to go with the positive note, but how long it took her to do this film. Like, if I sat there, it's my, many times I'm seeing it, and how long it took her, with all the money black people have, for her to not have the, at all turn, you know, for almost, what, 15, 20 years, 15? Yeah, 10, 10 years. years. 10, and 10 years. Every corner, we could have made it easier, but it's the way it is, and I get my sister is really strong, very strong. I want you to be here for our camera's sake. And then I hopefully you know how to put this thing somewhere in your bracelet here. What? We'll have, yeah, we'll, we'll have it. I know. It doesn't move. Okay. No I don't problem. want to move. Okay. Just be free. Move as you want. I'm wearing this hat for a reason. You have to stay up your height. 
This hat is the, it's the 60th Port Chicago commemoration. Who knows what the Port Chicago event was? It was a Navy event in, uh, in San Francisco. In San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, Brother Acklin Lynch knows. <laughs> 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 they wanted some brothers who worked in the Navy to unload some bombs, and they went off, and then a lot of the brothers got court-martialed. So there's an organization I work with in, uh, in Los Angeles called the Black Hollywood Education and Resource Center. And the woman who runs the organization, Sandra Evers Manley, is one of the top female executive, corporate executives in the country. Uh, she's a director of ethics for Northrop Grumman. But through her organization, she does projects like this. They brought all of the survivors of Port Chicago and their families together, and they took them up to San Francisco, and they went to the graveyard, and they did a memorial, and they came back. There has not been a film done by that. The reason I wanted to have this hat on, I've been wait, work, waiting for this minute for a long time, is that while I was working on the film, Haile came to Los Angeles to speak for a Holocaust conference there. And I had asked if I could make a presentation, and they gave me like 10 minutes. And I got up and I did my little spiel. I, had been, I was about four years into the film then. And everybody was very polite. It was very nice. And they raised their hands and said, you should go there, and you should go there, and you should go there. And Haile jumped up in the middle of the room and said, you cannot let this sister walk out of here like this. She needs money. She needs help. And he took his hat off. He took somebody's hat off of somebody else's head. And he passed it around the room. And I walked out of there with $200. So Haile is working on his next film. And I brought this hat all the way from Los Angeles. He gets the hat. But y'all got to put something in it for the next film. OK. <laughs> you can be an embarrassed if you want to. That's OK. Yes, it's a trick. That's because I want to tell you about this brother. And it's very short. When I had an opportunity to include him in the film, he said, and he was out doing a film festival, his words were, tell me what you need, sister, whatever you need, my sister. And you don't know what it means to hear that when you're under stress. And there was another time when I needed to connect with something. Oh, I, I wanted to use the footage in the film. Tell me what you need, sister. Just tell me what you need. I send it to you. You have no idea what it means, highly, to me to have a support like that, to know that all you have to do is ask, and it's going to happen. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Why were the brothers court-martialed? Court because the bombs were exploding, and they were killing people. And they'd sent, they told the black soldiers they had to go back in there and move them. They didn't send the white soldiers back. So the black soldiers were court-martialed for, for mutiny, as a mutiny. But they wouldn't do it. They refused to do it. So, so 300 of them, were, I think, were court-martialed. Some went to jail, some died in jail. Some, like 20 years later, were exonerated, but you know, several lifetimes later. It's a very long story that very few black people know anything about. And there has not been a film done about it. So those of you who are filmmakers or you know, writing the children's history books, or you know, we have so many stories to tell. We have so many stories to tell. I think, I think I've added to that pain of, of that story, San Francisco, which once had a large black population, today now has only 3% of the population black. Wow. As a result of gentrification. And that, and that happened under Willie Brown, a mm. black like politician, who in turn passed over the mayorship of San Francisco to a very wealthy 19th century white boy. So, I, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lesson from that mm -hmm. pain of, of that experience to what is happening. Is, and the people of San Francisco who knew that story from the 40s and 50s are now displaced, living all over other parts of Northern California, where they've mm -hmm. been moved out of San Francisco. And they're even moving them out of Oakland now. Mm -hmm. And San Francisco is no longer a, a children-friendly city. Mm -hmm. No. It's no longer a children-friendly city. Yeah. And Washington, D.C. is heading yeah. in the direction of San Francisco. But they're beginning to do the same thing to Oakland. Yes, Oakland. Which yes. is across the water across from San the water Francisco. The there you are, my brother. Thank you. Because that. that's part of the movie. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. That's part we'll of the movie. We'll go straight to this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my sister. OK. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> 
I'm passing out this flyer. I humbly apologize. You were supposed to get them before the film, and I forgot I had them. Uh, but this tells you about the artists who are in the film. There's another one. I don't have enough of them, but I ask the teachers, those of you who are teaching, take them first. It's called Related Information, and it includes projects, CDs, books, uh, sites, locations that are related to this film. This list and more is on my website. So if you're a teacher, take one. You can copy it, but you can also go to my website and download it, www.asharpshow.com. And this list of related uh, events and books and things is on that list. Question. That is dialogue. OK, Tendai first? Oh, no. no. Just, oh, OK, brother in the back. Yes, um, I do this. Thank you so much. Remarkable. Thank you. I started in April of 90, 1994, so it was 10 and a half years uh, from the first day of shooting, not including a little bit of planning, till the premiere in Los Angeles. And I shot first in Los Angeles with the sister in the wheelchair, Ryua Kinshigon, and that was supposed to be the film. And then it, I looked at the footage and people were not getting it, that whole emotional thing that happened. We tried to reset it up at a museum just for that. It, it just, people were not getting it. So I didn't know what was going to happen, because that was the film, and it wasn't working. So I had to step back, and it was at that point that um, I was getting ready to say it was at that point that the ancestors stepped in, but uh, they were already in. I just didn't know it. So um, the rest of the experience was just incredible, and I'm going to try to publish the complete interviews, uh, so you, because you just get parts of them here, and the stories of how they came about. I, my godfather passed. Well, I had an elder that was a good friend of my mother's, was like a second grandmother in Los Angeles. And when she died, she left me some money in her will. And there was the, you know, all the probate stuff. So about a couple years went by, and they called up one day, and they said, where do we send the check? And I'm like, what check? You know, so they sent the check. I didn't know what was happening with the film again at that point. I put it in the bank. About a year later or so, my godfather passes. And I had promised my godfather when he first knew that he had prostate cancer, some seven years earlier, he asked me if I would take his ashes to Gory Island. So about three days after he passed, I woke up and I said, oh my God, Gory Island. Oh, you know, I had forgotten. And it came back to me, I said, I must be going. And then it was like, damn, I really wish I could film while I was in Gory Island if I just had the money to film. And a few days later, it's like, dummy, you have the money, it's in the bank. You know, Francis gave it to you. So I got to film in Gory Island. At the very end of the film, I stopped to look. I said, what is missing from the film? There are five things that I wanted to include in the film. I could not afford to do all of them. And I decided that Katrina Brown, the white filmmaker in Boston, was the most important one. We had been missing each other for two years. We had not met. Somebody had brought her information to me. I sent my information to her. She couldn't do it then. I couldn't do it then. She didn't, you know, this had been going on for two years. And at that point, I picked up the phone, and she was down on her project trying to raise money. And she said yes. And two weeks later, I got on a plane, flew to Boston, filmed her the next day, came home that night. It was that quick. Um, this is a place I can really tell the Sankofa story, and I know it would be appreciated. The um, <clears throat> Ma'afa story, you know, when you saw Reverend Youngblood in the Ma'afa conference. I had done a workshop for, not for Ma'afa conference, but for their women's group several years earlier. Then they found out about Ryua, they had brought her in. She had done a workshop. So I wanted to get to New York to film because I had John Hunnick Clark, Chester Higgins, and Gil Noble on audio tape, but I did not have them on videotape because I could not afford to film them. So I wanted to get to New York to try to film. I contacted an organization that gave emergency money to artists, and I w my grant was pending, and I call up Monica Walker at <clears throat> the MAFA conference, and I said, what's happening, girlfriend? And she said, are you coming in? I said, I really can't right now, I want to. She said, be our guest, book your plane ticket. So I used to live in New York, you know, it's major stress, so I'm going to New York, I have to prepare. So I'm doing my meditations about New York, my meditations about New York. And and there's something off, there's something off. Right in the middle, there's something off, and I can't figure out what it is. And next day, there's something off. It takes about five days, and I finally I say, wait a minute. It's not me that's dark, it's New York that's dark. It's New York that's dark. What is this about? So I have to work on this tomorrow morning. Get up the next morning, I'm supposed to do the meditation on why is the, the middle of the thing New York, why is it dark? I fall back asleep. And I wake up, it's like, oh, this is not good. I have, I'm leaving in like, you know, 48 hours, and I have no appointments. I'm gonna have to do this later. Let me get on the phone. I call Bob Law. I mean, you remember Bob Law from WWRL. 
I'm talking to him. He's sounding very distracted. I said, what's up? He said, do you have your television on? I said, no. He says, I'm not sure, but I, if this is a movie or something, but I think somebody just flew a plane into the World Trade Center. So I wait to get this cancellation from the MAFA conference, and I check in, and she says, we're going to go ahead and have the conference. And anybody who can get in, we're going to play it by ear because we really feel we need to do this at this time. She said, I may call on you to do your workshop. I said, OK. Planes are all canceled. Planes are down. The airline says, if you want to change your ticket by 24 hours, you can. I do that. Meditate that morning. New York is bright and clear in my meditations. It's like sunshine. Everything is like zing. So I get on a plane to New York. They call me the next morning and ask me to do my workshop. Sister comes to my workshop. I see her in the hall the next day. What is this film that you're doing? I tell her about it. How can I help? I said, I need money to shoot. I don't have it because the agency that was going to give me the emergency grant when I called them, four of their people were out looking for family members. I said, Finn, don't worry about it. You know, you will not hear from me again. It's all right. Do what you got to do. This sister goes to the phone and in two sentences gets me the money to shoot. There's this fun we have there. There's something I want taken care of now. <laughs> the Monica says, gets on the phone. One of our guests has a check. She says, you have to cash that to pay your crew. I say, she says, hold on. She gets on the phone. Look, this is something Monica over the phone. So I'm sending one of our guests over with the driver. She has a large check. Cash that. I wake up the next morning, I have the money, I don't have the crew because I have this one guy that I haven't met who's referred to me and he doesn't want to shoot two days and he wants, doesn't want to do this and he doesn't want to do that. But I had this list in my pocket from my LA film people of people to contact. And the deal at that point is if you were in news, you were working 24 hours a day. If you weren't in news, everything was dead because you couldn't move in New York. You certainly couldn't be walking around with a camera unless you had a badge from a news crew. So I wake up around 5.30 that morning and I say, I have to get I have to change this person. I need somebody else who's going to work with me. I get on the phone. By 3 o'clock, I had a crew. I had Gil Noble, who said he was going to be in a meeting in Harlem. And I said, what time do you get out? And he said, around 3. And I said, will you film for me? Can we do this interview? He said, where? I said, I don't know yet. <laughs> I'll let you know. I, I ran up to um, Orlando Bagwell's office. Uh, Roja Productions, Brother Who Did, Dance in America, Africans in America, all of those. <clears throat> I said, the office looked like this room. Every desk was full. I said, I need a place to shoot. He said, you can't shoot up here. <laughs> I said, oh, well, help me out. He said, what about the Schomburg? He got on the phone. He got on the phone, and, and I'm saying, he's saying, S. Pearl Sharp, and I'm saying, no, say Sandra, because Mr. So-and-so, he doesn't remember me as S. Pearl. He remembers me as Sandra. I get this other guy on the phone who's saying, I don't know him. He said, well, I... I have to catch a plane. I have to, I have to catch a train to uh, DC, and I just I don't have time to arrange this. I said, there's nothing to arrange, brother. I got the crew to worry about. No, I, I, I said, look, brother, think about it for 10 minutes. I'll call you back. And I went over to the window, and I looked down 7th Avenue, and I said, take care of this brother, because I need the Schomburg. And I call him back in 10 minutes, and he says, well, the only place that I can let you shoot is the Langston Hughes lobby. I said, I'll make it work, brother. <laughs> and I hung up the phone. I said, I got the Langston Hughes lobby. <laughs> Because you probably know that Langston Hughes' bones are underneath that circle in the lobby, right? Yeah. And the energy there is incredible. I got the Langston So I call Gil. I call you know, everybody. We go up there. We do the shooting. So that's how that trip went. Chester, the Maafa Conference. Normally, they take the Maafa Conference out to the ocean. You couldn't move. So the Almastad was coming in. So they went to and they all walked a couple miles to this nearby dock. And that's where they filmed it. I took my little film after eight days and came on home. You know, New York is bright. Mm. <laughs> so it was that kind of understanding. I mean, you can't go through that kind of experience and not understand that there's a higher power <clears throat> that is in control of this project and wants certain things done, you know, a certain way. And so my thing was there were like five or six times when I had no idea what the film was, what to do next, where the money was coming, you know, how it was going to fit together. When my godfather passed, I knew. It fit into the film, but I did not know how for about seven or eight, nine months. Mm. So, so go back and you know do the laundry and pay some bills and you know whatever else you have to do until they send you the next message. Mm. <laughs> and that's how the film began to come together. And so every person coming into, I was just telling them earlier, I wanted Haile in the film, of course, Sankofa and all of that, but I could not afford to come to D.C. And I'm driving down Wilshire Boulevard, 
and I pass this marquee, and I'm like, did I, I almost hit somebody? Did I just see Haile Grima on a marquee in Beverly Hills? I go around the block, two blocks, and sure enough, there's this African film festival, three days that I didn't know about, and they're showing two of Haile's films. I go home, I get on the phone immediately. Somebody tell me where Haile Garima is. Is he coming to LA with these films? Yes, he'll be there in a couple of days. I'll be, where, where is he landing? You know? And so I made arrangements through Tespu, God bless him, he didn't even know me. But he's giving me all these phone numbers, you know, how to reach Haile, you know, who's driving him, how to reach him. Haile had a four hour window. And one of my DPs had just come back from Switzerland or someplace. I had an urgent message, oh, you gotta call me immediately, minute you land, he called me. I said, look, Haile Green is in town, I got a four hour window, can you give me a half a day? He said, I haven't even gotten to my house yet. <laughs> I ain't not home yet, I just got him from Switzerland. I'm still at the airport, just tell me, can you shoot tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> I had a four hour window. <laughs> Only for you, okay. And that's how we got Haile in. I mean, I had people standing by, everybody short of the police because his film was premiering and he's over on the other side of town filming for me. And so we got him out of there, whisked him in. He got in just, you know, just in time to introduce his film. I think, did you get there in time? Yeah. Just. I mean, like they're like almost waiting for him. So that's how everything happened in terms of this film coming together and all of the elements. And so I am very blessed to have this roster of artists doing the work that they're doing and then to have them come together in this piece. And uh, I'm honored to be the vehicle. And, uh, and now I'm signing off. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to know how long have you had the passion to do a film uh, um, with the stuff you have? It's been some 10 years in the film, but prior to that, how long have you been? On this particular subject matter, I really didn't tune into this until I walked into Ryu's installation on The Most Mutinous Left Overboard. And what happened there, I had made, when I did my book, Black Women for Beginners, I connected with some Afro German women. And one of them had a father who lived in San Diego. And so she was coming to see her father, came through Los Angeles, gave me a ring. She was going to be here for a few days. And it was the same time that Alice Walker's book came out about um, circumcision. And so, uh, not that book, the one she did with the... Secret of Joy. Secret of Joy, yes. Okay. And they were having book parties. And so I wanted to take her to something, so I took her to that. And for just for reasons where to this day I cannot explain, my, br my brain said, maybe she'd like to meet Ryu. Now, she's not an artist. You know, there was no particular reason for me to make that connection. But I called up Ryu and said, I'd like to bring down this sister for you to meet. And when I walked into Ryu's loft, her artist loft, this installation, when she took it down from the first thing at the Pan-African Film Festival, she had set it up in her house. Wow. And so just the two of us, the Afro-German sister and myself got to experience the installation and I said then this needs to be documented and that was the beginning so I did not really was not on that path um, at that time so one of the interesting questions that has come up about the film was uh, and I have an essay on the website on it who gets to heal because I was kind of in the same place as some people, and some people attacked the film when I was trying to raise funds because of the idea of white people being told that they can heal from this too or that they should heal from this too. Some of us feel that we have, only, we have all the pain and therefore only we have the right to the healing. And I was kind of in that place at the same time, so working with Ryua helped to pull me out of that place and to another place. But when I was on Goy Island, on the, on the ferry on the way over there the first time, I met a sister from somewhere like Montana or someplace, I'm not sure where, where she teaches. And every year she takes 10 or 12 students and brings them to Gory Island. Wow. And so when we, I was telling her about the film, I'm bubbling over about the film, and she, oh, we must talk, you must talk to my students, we're gonna hook up and, you know, as soon as we get on Gory Island. And then somehow I dropped something about Ryua asking white people as well about healing. And she just, shut down. she's totally shut down. I didn't get to meet her friend. They'd see me on the island, they'd go the other direction. <laughs> It was over. She was too pissed. <laughs> so I hadn't, I hadn't confronted that before. You know, I didn't realize that the feeling was that strong and that that was one of the issues in, up in this. So that had to be dealt with, you know, as well. And it had to be dealt with through my transition, you know, to the other side. Yes. I was so glad you Done. included that. I thank you so much for just seeing the people. You, 
I've seen some of those artists' work mm -hmm. and to see those artists. But that part in particular was very, she explained to me what we feel like. I'm homeschooling my nine-year-old because I feel that we don't teach them soon enough mm -hmm. the purpose of getting the education. Mm -hmm. And when she said that because she had did this work, she could look at us. Mm -hmm. She could feel, because we feel that all the time. I remember being in college and having a white roommate in the room and no physical <laughs> eye contact. Mm -hmm. Why? They don't even know why they have that. Or going past people on the street. No, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just automatically wired to say to humans, hi. Mm -hmm. And I cannot stand not receiving the high back. I've yeah. learned to deal with it, mm -hmm. but that's why. Like you're not on the planet. Like I'm not even yeah. on the planet. Yeah. And she explained to me why they do that. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell? I said hi. <laughs> I, and, and so I've gotten past trying to make people speak to me. Mm -hmm. But now I understand. That's what it is. Okay. This privilege that they know they are receiving, the guilt that's there, mm -hmm. as well as what kind of healing they need mm -hmm. from that middle passage. Because my textbook for my daughter is Roots. And a lot of people only saw the movie Roots. Yeah. But if you read the, the book, book, you understand why Kunta was Kunta Kente, why he refused to be told me. Mm -hmm. You have so much more substance. Mm -hmm. And if they learn why they have that privilege, because they don't know. Like Ola Tunj said, they really want to know. Do they have tails there? And this Are is, they yeah. swinging in a tree? And this is us asking him these yes. questions. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned the Kunta Kinte uh, and that subject of, of reading the book because LeVar Burton, who played Kunta Kinte, uh, they have a storytelling festival in LA every year. And one year what he did was he read the part of Martin Luther King's speech that comes before I Have a Dream, which we rarely read. Wow. And it is so heavy. Yes. It is so politically heavy yes. that you understand why they started with I Have a Dream. Wow. <laughs> And left the rest out. Right. You know. And highly, another reason why I want to publish the complete interviews, because one of the things Hailey talks about in, on my tape is that's not in the film, the concept of trying to think in another language that is not your mother language. And how at a certain point he stopped uh, reading in English because it was affecting his mind so. And, and so think how many of our our students, our young people, are going yes. through that process. Yes. The problem of trying to think in another yes. language, another idiom almost, yes. um, in order to pass a test, you know. I think yes. part of me um, wants to just say, let white people who have stolen the resources from every country in the world, every use those resources to heal themselves mm -hmm. and let us heal ourselves. I think I think it's it was good to see it in the film because it makes it takes away the anger. We can't mm. deal with anger. And yeah. somehow you can't present it to them with anger. So you include them and you mm. show some compassion, some modicum of compassion for this, you know, I want to say beast. The spirit mm. in them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there's a part of me that feels that compassion for them because they lack that humanity. But at the same time, because they have robbed the world, everybody, they need to take, they have this institution set up where they can go and heal themselves and let us take care of our business because when they get involved in us, with us, somehow, Conquering and taking. Yes. Or they divide us or you know, something happens. We lose ourselves. Yes. Well, thank you.
Well, on behalf of Adasi, we are really blessed to have the opportunity to sponsor you. Thank you. Okay. On the on the you know healing racism America's challenge, you know mm -hmm. that's been his baby, and I've done work in that arena. And at the same, so at one point I thought, well, maybe it's not right for me to be so focused on our folks because of my spiritual background and also because of the work that I've done. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I said, well, maybe this most high, maybe Baha'u'llah has me in in the arena that I'm in for a reason. Mm -hmm. So I've you know done a lot of stuff and studied a lot of things and one thing that Renoko and Shidi said on his tape on one of his lectures that he did is find an area that no one else is interested in mm -hmm. and focus on that area. Right. And so that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So if my European brothers and sisters want to heal from racism, fine. But I don't have to be in the midst of it. I got to work on my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if they want to come to my mm -hmm. house and participate, that's great, but I don't have to go and recruit so, you know, let me, can I interject something? You know, you know how I got it? And I know, uh, you know, where I'm tripping is in another direction. I agree with this idea that I think they have the finance, the, the, the paratroopers, the psychologists. They have everything if they want to face it. They have at yeah. their disposal. Yeah. You know, and I think this issue, if you really see what's happening in South Africa, what white South Africans are doing to black people now, right. for not having killed them, Right. You would be amazingly confused about the human nature. Wow. But what I saw in this movie, for me, what it does, I think, is get other black people. I was so impressed with this white girl. Yes, To organize, too. to go retrace her yes. history. Yes. And I think it's going to make a whole lot of black folks go who don't even it. go to Africa, who go to Paris all the yes. time. They're going to rethink because they're not going to hear us going to Africa. Some of them are going to hear... That is going to really put fire on some black people. To me, it's mm -hmm. like she's organized her race, her you know genealogy. Yes. Some believed, some didn't believe. Hey, she's going to survive when the boat goes down with those nine, not the fifteen of her relatives. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So to me, how when I saw when I saw that the first time included, I was saying it it makes the ones who are uh, passively sitting black people who are not making the journey to heal. That's a fire on their butt. I think the purpose mm. of that for me is it makes some black people that I'm having a hard time reaching mm -hmm. kick their butt to say, if this white girl is doing this, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> right. and I think that is the power of what I got out of it. I don't know if this would help, but I am with you in the sense. I'm sure my, I know my sister very well, but the point here is I think the way the film came to her and the way he straight shot with the question, she had just said, listen, I'm trying to get over my own guilt situation. And I think it's a lesson for other black people who, re who don't realize the importance of cleansing mm -hmm. or spiritual journey, etc. And I don't know if this is a, I'm gonna take that sister, one oh, second, no. that sister. I'm gonna to come to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a, a Haitian uh, a rap there. I, want, I don't know if she's from Haiti. Come on, sister. Okay, it's okay.
I just say to you that you don't lock yourself into the either or because you never know when something's going to pull you over to the other side and you end up doing some healing of somebody that last week you said, I'm not going there. Right, right. You know, and then you find yourself in the presence and your higher mind says, I'm here for a reason. My sister, yes. Um, I, I must make these comments and I apologize if I offend. We just spent 15 minutes talking about white people, which is an indication of what their presence does. We all know that they have to uh, deal with this issue, but in the process of our dropping them in the middle of our discussion, we don't understand that subconsciously, we, uh, subconsciously, we are asking them for permission to heal ourselves. Fuck them! Well said. We don't need that. We know that they need to heal themselves. We need to heal ourselves. There were so many different areas in there in that film that we need to be talking about now yes. we're talking about these goddamn crackers. And I'm sorry for, for We don't even understand what they do when they walk in our presence. Fine if she went and got her family together. I'm surprised she's looking for money if they sat and stole everything. Why she got to go a scrounge for some money? What sense does that make? Because they don't want the film Let to, us move to be out there. past this and talk about the images that Tom Feeling left with us. Oh. Let us move past that and talk about the, the, the uh, Olatunja and what he was speaking to. When the film started and someone was speaking Yoruba, I don't know what they said, but it shook me to my core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Forget these white people. I'm sorry. Don't apologize, don't sister. Apologize. I, I thank you for your comment, sister, but I don't think that we are, if I may say, that we are asking white folks permission for us to heal. I think, I don't think we're doing that, because I think Everybody in this room knows that we have a lot of work to do. We really do. So. Okay, so we still talk about them, so we're going to go to something else. So who else said they had. Because you, it's 0.5 of the movie. I really agree with my sister here. Yeah. And I and understand. Because it's point 0.5, it diverted us to a negative area. But I think the point here is this: I think we can't be, we can't, we have to remain human because that's what salvaging. If there's going to be any change in black people, black people have to re remain human. Now, to remain human is not that the expense of our own humanity. That I think is like the debate, and everybody identifies with that. I think the fact there's agony, it shows our humanity. But I think I agree. For example, some of the most important part of this movie are the ancestors who've left us. Yes. I mean, Oscar yes. Brown, oh. yeah. Ola Tunji, yeah. uh, Tom, yeah. Tom Feelings. Yeah. I mean, it's so... To the DC Sanyika. And then what she did so with the image. What she did with the image she created and giving it that boat feeling. Yeah. And I think this is what my sister is saying. Let's really go to the discussion of the film and then... We don't see her again. We look the way we work. We work at our fundraising situation is bad. <laughs> better, so white people are better than us. We know that. But we get her once in a blue moon. I think it's good to go into her philosophy and in in her relationship to all these different points she brought. Well, this, the story has narrative. You know, it, it began. So she has captioned everything, sectioned it. These, are, I think, are important because some of us didn't, must not also must know what that whole structure is all about. Why didn't she have this spiritual structural narrative in the film that continued to unfold like onion? And I think that's more important, and I agree. Let's go on, let's forget them. Besides, white folks are not even discussing about this Thank now. You. They're actually in Georgetown removing more other black people, more <laughs> gentrification. Right, right. <laughs> They're like removing black people. They're talking how to buy Washington DC, <laughs> get all black people out. You know, get to Anacosta, get more black people out. They're we're really busy doing that. And so we're not, we shouldn't be threatened. Go ahead, sister. Sister Tinda. You, you, you had your hands down. 
What do I do? That's what she I said. Pray I pray okay, you fight it between well, the two. Well, I'm just saying, sister, when uh, those of us who saw the film previously, that was an issue. It was an issue? It was an issue um, because it, it, it takes you on an emotional roller coaster. You're in one place with the ancestors, and then when Katrina Brown comes in, your emotions switch. You go, <gasps> and then you go back. You know what I'm so it, it is sort of like the ship mm -hmm. and whatnot. But I think it also brings some resentment into the film, and it takes you a while to get back into it. Mm -hmm. Because the resentment is, I'm in the middle of my pain and my emotion, and I'm trying to find myself, damn, can I have something without a crack in the middle mm -hmm. of it? Which is exactly what happens on Gory Island. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's why they gave African Americans their own tours. The same, right, the same thing we know. We know, well, those of us at least who have, have been and had that experience. So I'm saying it's, it's not that there, there isn't some value, but I'm saying it's depending on what it is that, that you were trying to do with the film, whether or not we got it. And as I was mm. saying, emotionally, intellectually, I can go there. Emotionally, I have okay. issues, really have issues yeah. with it. Because, like I said, I go like this. Okay. I'll tell you what I'm, what I'm doing with it when we talk some more. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I just wanted to, to say thank you with, for all of the um, correlation between the water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have discovered for myself in the past five or six years that I am emotionally and spiritually dehydrated. Whoa. I know it's there. Mm -hmm. Before my trip to Ghana, I did nothing but weep the whole time. And when I was there, I had one episode where mm -hmm. the manifestations came, and it seemed like the whole bus just went off. And mm -hmm. they said, I'm Weeping, a whale. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. There's no doubt that they are just all in me, mm -hmm. and I am mm -hmm. all into them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, there's, we've got to be able to function cohesively. I mean, what I really wished I had on film was us getting her to the water that morning because the brother had four boards. We put two in front of the wheelchair, rolled her oh, three feet, right. picked those up, put those two in front of the wheel. Well, But for her, it was no question. She was going. So you see her rolling across that sidewalk, you know, us getting her from the top of this hill down to that, down to that beach to, and down to that sidewalk, you know, that was an awesome experience at 4 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but she was clear that she could do that and she wanted to. So I think, you know, it's an individual thing. And a year from now, you may be in another, it may not even be a problem. You don't know. Yes, Brother Jim. Yes, I want to thank you for um, doing what you're doing. Thank you. You've, um, my being here tonight has uh, just further increased my understanding, development, and learning about the situation that I'm in personally. Um, for everybody, I want to say my people. I always say when I see things that kind of disturb me, I say my people, my people, my people. What are we going to do? When I see stuff that just doesn't make sense to me, I say that all the time. I want to say that we have to create our own environment. You can't worry about what other people are doing. We have to do what we want to do. We have to create that ourselves. A uh, perfect example was three weeks ago, almost three weeks ago, I called Dr. 
things popping, because I really admire and respect what he's doing. At his house, he had a, he created an environment for us. Everybody that was there had a wonderful time. It was, it was very spiritual. It was very spiritual, and I thought it was great because, um, forgive me, the brother from um, New Orleans, poet. Oh, because I know it's here. He said, and yeah. this, this is what really impressed me. He said, look around. Black people don't get together. This is D.C. Just look around. And mm. that summed up the whole evening because there was no fighting, no guns. It was a very positive environment. And this is what we have to do instead of worrying about what other people are thinking of us or what mm. other people are doing. We have to do it ourselves. And mm. I admire highly for doing what he's doing because he created these environments for us. And we need to do more of it. Who's going to do the next program like, like uh, Dr. Lynch did? Who's going to do it? We need to have this all the time. So, you know, we can't worry about what other people are doing. We have to do what we're going to do. Thank you so much for the film and for your ongoing work. When I look at the work, there are a number of things that come to mind that are very important to me. One is the notion of suicide. Mm. People committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And yet still in today's world, the people in the Middle East are committing suicide. In Palestine and Lebanon mm. and Iraq, etc. Mm -hmm. And we have a totally different interpretation of, it. of what suicide means. The Japanese did it, in World War II, and a negative approach in terms of the language, because suicide is supposed to be the act of a coward or an unchristian act, an unholy act, whilst we look at it here tonight as a sacred act of resistance. Mm. Very, very Beautiful. important. Thank you. And how can we get to that? And how can we pass on that notion of suicide to our children mm. who live in fear of the concept? Mm -hmm. or, or even want to participate in, in the they ritual, do. whatever that ritual is, yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. You know, when it comes to that. I think that was very, very important for me. It was very also important for me to mm -hmm. see that the ashes were taken back to Gory Island. Mm -hmm. Because in our Christian tradition of burial, ashes leaving here to go there. And I remember when when, 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 in, in the 19, middle 1960s, and, and, and um, you had a, a Sweet Honey and the Rock in here, when Bernice came, uh, uh, one of our, our brothers who had been killed and, 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 and assassinated here by the police in the 60s, right out here in, in Eastern uh, uh, Maryland, Ralph Featherstone, yeah. Yeah. when Ralph asked that his ashes be taken back to Africa, spread in Africa, it was a concept that we had a great deal of difficulties trying to understand and, and analyze. So mm. here it is now in this question because we are tied and bound to a national identity and a passport and a birth certificate. Mm -hmm. So the notion of ashes going. Yeah. When, when, when Eric Williams talked about having his ashes spread in the Gulf of Paria and in Trinidad and so on, the people considered him to be Heathen. You see what I'm saying? So this is a, a notion that is coming around that we have great deal of difficulties trying to, to come to grips with. You know, it's not, it's not easy, all right? So for me, that is also very, very, very critical to see inside of the movie. The other part of the movie that I think is, is very critical is how does someone who is in a wheelchair have the capacity and the audacity and the courage as artists to move us in a most transcendent way, those of us who are physically old. Thank you. Because those people take yeah. a, a lesser role in our lives and we wish that we may never be like them because they are handicapped. You see mm -hmm. the word that is used for, for it. If you see what I'm saying now. Yes, I and do. here is somebody who becomes the energy source Mm -hmm. of the entire work. Yes. Mm -hmm. if, yes. if, you, if, you, if you see what I'm saying, yes. that, we have to, that we have to deal with. Yes. And I won't go too long, but I'm, I'm looking at it in fact. Mm -hmm. 
Here is a man. Here is a man, Tom Felix, who when he did it, knew that he was on his way to death. Remember. And we are being frightened and terrified by whether it is a woman who has breast cancer or a man who have uh, uh, prostate. prostate cancer mm -hmm. who are dying in front of us every day. But in, in, in those moments of dying, as, as we pray for them, we forget to free them to allow them to do the creative work and the spiritual work that they should be doing. And every step of the way, Tom's feelings was talking about the very essence of his creative work and the spirituality of his work. Very different from Haile Dorema, who was talking about the intellectual side of the work. Tom Feelings was talking about what it is I'm leaving here. It, it was almost like, you know, well, I know I'm going. It, you, you know, and he, he, he's, he's dealing with what does all this mean to him. But he wants to leave something that we could connect with, which, which is essential and we have to take to that. Mm -hmm. Now, having said all of those kinds of things, I want to go to one little place. And I'm not going back to this white girl, but having said all of that, I want to say something about her that is important, I think. Yes. One, I told Jesus that I changed my name. Jesus. Billy Holiday and everybody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Nina Simone, everybody. I told Jesus to change the name. Very critical. From Malcolm Little to yeah. Satan yeah. to Detroit Red to Malcolm X to El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Mm -hmm. A whole change in time and space and consciousness mm -hmm. and personal. Mm -hmm. All right? This girl's family's name was D. Wolf. D. Wolf yeah. These are Jewish people all the way from Holland and Belgium yeah. Yeah. who were engaged in the slave trade. Yeah. And she changed her name from D. Wolf to Katrina Brown. Brown. Fascinating. Brown. Absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, at least looking at it. Yeah, because you can't tell. Wait, 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 no, 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 I don't want to even, let me finish. I don't want to go nowhere, I don't want to go nowhere that I am, that I ain't say. When I finish that, you can do whatever you want with it. I talk about all the other side, but I don't want to come in. Now, what was fascinating to me about her in her statements, her many important statements, and you can go back to the text, is that she said, and this is where language becomes very important, because Oscar Brown, and Tom Feelings and them talked about the role of language. Yes. And so did Bamola Tunji. What does language mean? Mm -hmm. In her language, she said that other people went through the same experience of the Middle Passage and referred to Jews, mm -hmm. Catholics. Catholics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was a, that was deep mm -hmm. for me. Yes. Catholics. Because so I, I, I left it in there. Church. I was supposed to be an altar boy. I was uh, supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to be an altar boy coming out of church. I wasn't supposed to be here at all tonight. So I want you to understand that. Catholics, Jews, you understand that? And we know what the Pope just said about the, 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 the people of, 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 of Islam. You understand that? So, so that even though you're talking about a person's humanity, how is their language constructed? You're the first person to pick up on that. No, oh, I, I want to, to speak on it. All right. Speak on so it. So all of that is yeah. important for me yeah. in understanding all mm -hmm. the positive side of our elements. Mm -hmm. But now here she comes back in her world of privilege and in her world of, of changing her name, mm -hmm. which Jews did in Europe and in America. Mm -hmm. They changed their names well, in order to be able to be what? In order to be able to be senators, which is what she said. Uncle, her uncle, uncle ones. Mm -hmm. In order to be senators, they anglicize themselves. Mm -hmm. And now, finally, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, inside of all of that experience of the Holocaust, and inside of all the experience of slavery and mad that we experience, we still have Darfur, the Congo, yeah. Rwanda, Burundi, mm -hmm. Sierra Leone, which we must deal with, yeah. and Africa, and they must deal with Lebanon. Palestine, yes, in which the inhumanity of Europe manifests itself in every single historical detail. Yes, That's what this movie was done. Thank, yes. Thank you. See, Thank now, you. I, that's why I didn't want to give, actually it should be like the ending thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, should end, it should end the whole thing. Now, I hope it didn't discourage folks to, who, who want to ask questions Wait. also. Don't yes, my brother. Okay. I want to come back to a point. Okay. Then go. No, no, let her, let her do it and we come to you. Okay, okay. go ahead. Brother Ackland, Lynch, Brother Lynch, I'd like to clarify 
the thing about the suicide, because black people used to, when you heard about somebody who killed themselves, you knew it was white folks. And then over the last, about 10 years or so, I noticed that the rates of suicide among blacks was now like 50% higher than it had been 25 years ago. So I just wanted to be clear about what you were saying about suicide. I, I just political suicide. Because poli people okay. jumping off the ships, that was political was suicide. suicide. Right. That was mm -hmm. not suicide from, 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 from some social defect. Right. Yes. If you see what yes. I'm saying, yes. that is okay. not suicide no. from some no. kind of, um, no. what, what they call it, uh, somebody right. used the term in the, in the, in the, in the in, yeah, mental, you know, they used the mm -hmm. term inside of there. Somebody used that term, I think it was the preacher who used the term. Yeah. It's post traumatic syndrome. Post -traumatic. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that. So it was not, the, the suicide I'm talking about is not an, is not an annihilation of the spirit. Mm -hmm. It is not a it defecation a of the spirit. Right. But it is a, 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 an, an elevation, elevation of the spirit. Of because when you hear this boy, this young boy today talking about um, from, from Lebanon, from Hezbollah, yeah. mm -hmm. in today's papers, you see they have a whole, you should read it highly. There's a very important article on him on today's papers and a very important article on China. And the, and the speeches of, of, of Chavez, mm -hmm. who is a black man. Yes, yes. he is. Hope we understand that. Yes, yes. And we ain't looking at Chavez as no yeah. right, right. Latino. Who, no. who is a black no. man? Yes, no different yes. from me and you yes. and all of us yes. in here. Yes. All right. Now, I'm saying that when we look, when we look at this, this young brother today, who, who is the head of Hezbollah, and so mm -hmm. he defined the whole terms of the struggle in a very different way. That's and the right. Washington Post and the New York Times. And the language that he constructed where they quoted him is very, very important as distinct from the journalistic language to describe who he was. Mm -hmm. So we have to take, because they have a new attitude now of what victory means. Mm -hmm. yes. We had a certain attitude of victory in the spiritual, which we say, and I will die yes. before in resistance I and before I remain a slave, right. and I will go back home. Yeah. Yes. You understand that? We mm -hmm. had the language for that. Mm -hmm. And then that was turned in the Christian orthodoxy into a negative form. Mm -hmm. that's, what that, that's what I'm talking about. So Thank that's you. the suicide I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you. Clarifying. Half man. It's a, it's a hard to talk about, but it's a humble segue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dealing with the uh, healing process. I was wondering what role does uh, contemporary Africa play That's a lot of question, brother. Um, let me go to the, to the first part of it. In terms of the Africans and the African Americans, we have to have more dialogue with each other. On one level, there is an assumption, I think, that we kind of know each other. And on another level, there is almost a dismissal. So when the film premiered in 2004 in San Francisco, there was another film that showed that afternoon, and it was a film that a brother did about the relationship between African Americans and Africans. That film caused so much dialogue that they could not get us out of the room. They could not get us out of the room. They finally found another room around the corner, moved us over there, and it turned into a healing session. People crying, people talking, people weeping. And everybody knew that this was just the, this was the, just the touchstone, just the tip of some issues because we are moving around each other. Some of us are going to, I remember the first time I went to Africa was in 80 and I went with Howard's communication group. And I saw some things in Kenya that disturbed me. 
uh, you know, the, the, the tourism business was run by all of the whites, by all of the British, and the, the, the stores were run by all of the East Indians, and the, the Maasai were be, being put on, yeah. on, um, display. on display, you know, and, and, and the British had decided that, that milk was better for them or whatever, whatever they had before, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I came back and I talked about this, and some people attacked me. I was defaming Africa. You know, because we had this Africa is holy, we were in our Africa is holy period at that time. You know, just like there was a period of time when we would not talk about our involvement in the slave trade on the African side. And now we're talking about it. So I think the next step of our development is that we begin to sit down and talk with Africans from the continent on a different kind of level. The community I live in in Los Angeles is very interesting because I live on between, like, between this street and First Street, between First and Third for about a six block range, there are so many Africans from Senegal and the French speaking countries there and they all come in that area because there's a mosque there. And so every Friday from two to three you see all the sisters in their gowns, you see the brother going up there to the mosque to do their religious service. And they come together, they'll live together in that area for a while. Brothers come with their sewing machines from Senegal and they set up. What I've noticed is that the African Americans are primarily, I mean, they'll, they'll touch bases, you know, yeah, I need, this, I need this outfit made, brother, you're good, you know. But there isn't that real social connection. There isn't a sitting down and breaking bread. You know, there isn't a coming together that should be when we're living two and three blocks from each other. And until we do that, uh, we don't just go to the video store to get the videos until we have that kind of dialogue and that kind of interaction with each other and really begin to know each other, then I, I think, you know, a lot of this is lost. So that for me is one of the next steps that is important for us to do in the healing process. You know, you may not agree, but that's kind of what I see from, from the experience. Let me say now about the question of what do I hope you will take from the film. I hope that each of you will find something in the film that you can latch on to and do the work. It may be the language, it may be that you hear yourself saying something, or somebody, your children, or somebody in your house, or in your job, and you can correct that. Uh, I encourage people, when you hear people talking about the Holocaust, if you say to them without anger, excuse me, but if you could just put Jewish in front of that whenever you say it from now on, it leaves room for other people's Holocaust, like the African Holocaust. You don't have to be mad. You know, you can pick their teeth up off the floor for them and put them back in their mouth, because some of them, <laughs> you know, will be stunned that hadn't thought of it. But it's those little things that begin to make the change. If you have an altar in your house and you've been there for so long, you just kind of walk past and you, and you even forgot it was there, and you go back and you begin to deal with that altar differently. If you have not had an altar, because an ancestral altar, because of maybe you felt it conflicted with your, whatever your religious belief is, or you thought it was, you know, from some other realm, you might want to try it. So anything that you find in the film that you can latch on to and begin to do, that is how the work spreads. I had the film channeled. I did not intend to have the film channeled, but once again, the ancestors were at work. And I had the film channeled, and the messages that I got back were, part of it was beyond my ability to comprehend, so I had to go to Dadisi and another uh, incredible brother named Orlan Bishop, who I listed as one of my, the spiritual, uh, spiritual guides in the film. Um, but the first message that came was that the ancestors were really pissed with us because we had gotten all caught up in the pain and the gloom and the, and the, the destruction, and we had forgotten the love. We had forgotten the love that had taken place on both sides of the water, across the water, in the water, and that we were not celebrating that. That was the first message that came through. Um, the other part of the message which I had to say go get help with was in the realm of the idea that we, kn that we knew as a body of people that we knew that slavery was coming and that this was part of a mission that we accepted and agreed to take and that the information that we need now when I have her at the end of the film talking about waiting for your awakening is already in us. So when I got that, then I, for the first time I became clear about when I studied with Dr. Lagan in the Aquarian Center for so many years, and he called us the seed people. Yeah. We are the seed people. So the information is in us. We're sitting on it. We're partying on it. We're drugging it up. You know, we're too busy. We're emailing it. We, it don't work, you know. So getting back to that, what is that information, and what is that, well, how are we using it? The fact that I was sitting in the lobby here, and these sisters were exchanging recipes 
about herbs and how they were using them in some of the food that you had out here this evening. That's part of the healing, okay? That is part of the healing. So I'm asking us to readjust. It's not that you get, have to have 200 people and that you have to have a grant. It's that some sister went home and made a recipe with some herbs and brought it here this evening and explained it to another sister and they're gonna get the, and the next sister will do it and that will be healthier for us. You know, is that you understand that all the candles don't have to be white, <laughs> you know? Sister called me in tears one day. We had this program and we didn't have all white candles and the elder made us go get some and the store was closed and we had to drive and we came back with something else and she wouldn't let us start the program. We had to, and the other store was, and by the time we got started, it was two hours late and then some people that she was in tears. What it went wrong? I said, well, first of all, no disrespect to the elder, but all the candles don't have to be white, you know? <laughs> so I wanted that to be in the film because we get locked into stuff. So there's something that you're locked into. Maybe that is the work that you do from the film. So that, you know, as Dedesi said, it's up here. And however, whatever ritual you're creating for whatever purpose, you have the power and the authority to do that because you're on the planet. Yes, yes, that's the point, yeah. And what is that, I think to me, that's the most powerful part of the film. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. to me, the imperfection of a movie, if we get a perfect film, and I don't know where that's going to happen. So, you know, <laughs> to me, our right to make imperfect film is one thing. Right. But what is very prominent in this documentary film that occurred to me today is that all the people are artists which means art was maybe a healing, a healing task. Yeah. Ancestors work through all the different artists to communicate all, all what is communicated. And so our community's lack of support to artists, yes. almost for me, is almost a genocide of the drums yes. that's going yeah. on in, in the world yeah. because mm. the drummers are dying off in Africa. It's the Christian fundamentalism that I call Al-Christian. The Al-Christians are destroying everything African as a heathen work. From Zimbabwe to South Africa, Christians have, you know, you watch about Islamic fundamentalism, which is also a problem. But if you see the Christian fundamentalism in Ghana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Kenya, to me, you cannot imagine how many Africans are being lobotomized by this force. And nobody is speaking for them. Even when we talk about Darfur, you know, I really don't gauge on Darfur because to me, fundamentally, the genocide in Africa is Christian waged genocide. And nobody wants to deal with that. And that's my problem. Now, artists are being excommunicated in our community. If you look at inner cities, when inner cities were rich, where when black artists couldn't go anywhere but stay there. Which means art and living is complementary. Life and art is complementary. Every time the artists disappear, every time the artists disappear, life, so is the people. Young people kill each other, everything we experience. And usually there's one drummer or one trumpet blower somewhere that is a salvaging point. And so to me, I think, again, although this group is really a very activist group, one of the things is we have to take upon ourselves to, to really bring back the artists, claim them, and make them our functional uh, center points, our fireplaces. And I think Randy Weston yes. at Ackland's was this. This is what happened. Ackland knows how to do that. He had this guy in the center, and mm -hmm. art was just... Everybody was embellished by that energy. And so to me, our sisters work today. What made me just say, sitting there, I said, dang, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm part of the artists, but the artists are really central to the healing process. That everybody by now, with all this imperfection, artists are healers, is what's happening. Now, if that's the case, subsidizing art is very important. Yes. Encouraging our artists is very important. Nurturing our artists is important. Yes. We need to give home parties 
you know, apartment parties to sustain their livelihood. They don't have to disappear from our, or from the bosom of our children. And then we can see the children being regenerated in life. So for me, that part of it is powerful. Mm -hmm. We don't want to really underestimate that part. You, now, yeah, you say yeah, storytelling I'm is the first you, medicine. I'm telling yeah. you, the other part I want to say also is this. Uh, to me, you know, Sandy has been, you know, uh, my sister here, Madame Dignity. This is a, look at her hey, poster in her CD, by the way. <laughs> Madame Dignity says to me, no, this is her last film. And I don't believe it's her last no, it's film. Beginning. I'm yeah. telling you, yeah. the, the whole problem here is, I think there is a sequel in this thing, and it was proposed by that brother. That brother said, what is going to happen with continental Africans and African diasporas? I believe, to me, I'm from Africa. I have no, my problem here is the people we sold away are going to come back to challenge us, good or bad. Either the BET way or the, you know, the spiritually powerful and profound, the Dr. Ben and the Garvey and the Malcolm and the you know, Harriet Tubman, etc. Because I don't think we Africans, if we saw, even if we saw it for years when I was researching at the dungeon in Cape Coast, African Americans have this very, they take very offensive position in that dungeon when they see white people around them. And the Africans are just saying, what is wrong with these people? And it's the lack of the information, one. But at the same time, I don't think Africans have been confronted by the genuine revolutionary minded African Americans. I don't think we've been confronted. So to me, uh, I go back to what Sankara said. Sankara has said, you know, Africans now in the continent are willing to sell Africa for anything. For, for, for not only food, food at least is sensible, for luxury items that are like dysfunctional every time a Japanese sneezes some new shit we buy. It. And what is happening now here, he says, is that Africans in the diaspora would be the ones who would, pres who would be found preserving whatever is left of our history. And I think this greedy African-American perspective in, the, in terms of our history, the greedy aspect of our nationalism, our identity, is going to be in the end the, the, the torch that comes back to fire because I also believe local Africans, from my own self, you know, because I take my life as a pattern. I was very passive, Peace Corps educated, colonial minded Ethiopian when I hit this place. <laughs> now. African, Amer African Americans, <laughs> their life history, the confrontation I faced of African Americans has, have, has made me, in fact, more, more committed than some African Americans who started me. I can't say that I'm every African American, but the African Americans who challenged me made me think, rethink my, to get me out of the colonized way, they are now the biggest sellouts, my, and I feel like, damn, Haile, they started you, and you better give up because they, they were your teachers, they were your mentors. What happens? No, I'm going on because I believe Africans also can be a long distance runners for the good, the sensible, revolutionary, spiritual uh, energy that would come from the diaspora. because. In the journey of selling and returning, in that whole thing, some struggle is going to take place. In that struggle, I think we will see a better Africans. But the initial, the initial one is hard. And one of the things that I would suggest is, for example, there's this Caribbean guy, Oloisi at Acklands, crazy guy. <laughs> he, he proposed to me, let's have Ethiopians and that you know um, uh, Caribbeans all cook our cultural food, come together and eat. And I was thinking about it a lot because we had a town meeting because African Americans and Ethiopians are fighting on 9th Street. So we what? created a town meeting. When we created the town meeting, they fought more. <laughs> I don't know if you were, they started, the, the fight escalated. So I said, I'm getting out. First, African Americans called me and said, Ali, you better do something about your people. Some crazy people have come nowadays. What's wrong with them? So I said, okay, maybe I should call a meeting, and I put them together. They almost killed each other. Sandra Ratley scared after that. Now she wouldn't moderate any town meeting between this African genetically disoriented people. Now, what I would say to is, I think, but if we call again to eat and sit yeah, around and play music, from what she's saying now, what I get is 
I'm saying maybe the next town meeting is what the kind of thing Ackland does. Every nationality of African people bring food. Right. We sit down, we celebrate our just food. getting together. No, 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 sister, don't take it. Food is like the dangerous thing. That's like the animal kingdom. Food alone is not good. Because a whole lot of, we can go to, uh, we can go to uh, the, the hamburger place that Bill Cosby comes, or the hot dog place, what's it called? Ben's Chili. Ben's Chili. It doesn't work it. Ben's Chili doesn't work, because it's still the pork, it's still that thing. We have to work out many things about mm -hmm. the different rich, organic kind of thing we all can bring to the table, but also spiritual. Mm -hmm. Eating together has nothing to do with breaking breads, what mm -hmm. she said. To break breads together. If you, I don't know where you are from, my brother, but I think... To lecture each other would not work. We will argue, we'll be splintered more. But I think if we just bro you know, break, get together and break bread, we'll be fine. I don't know if that is the kind of proposal mm -hmm. that I think we should really push and not be just the, you know, the, the spiritual aspect of that. My sister there. Um, well, I really appreciate your tone. Um, Thank you. In the, the section where you're reading that poem, mm -hmm. I think the connecting with the, with the traditional spirituality for me goes way back. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I just thought of this, but when I lived in New York at the time that Imam Baraka had uh, the organization in New Jersey, and I was working with, uh, they were trying to get Ken Gibson elected. And so we would be over, uh, and that, that's where I'm going back to, okay. So we'd be over in New Jersey a lot, and I remember they had this tradition, they had this African wedding. One of the, two of the people in the group were getting married. And so it was supposed to be a traditional African wedding, but the, either the, like the groom's family was into the African thing, but the bride's was not. So when they came into the wedding, all of the one side of the family had on like the little hats and the gloves and you know and the pearls and and the, they were in there for that kind of wedding. You know they came up asking which side do we sit on because you know in the European tradition they separate you. You're either with the, the groom or the bride, right? And then the whole, whole other side was all in African attire and a dress. And it's like we were at this wedding and the two sides never came together. Wow. You know, and that was way back then, way back then. And I, I I've always remembered that. 69, right, because here they are trying to, in the, in the midst of one of the meccas of African nationalism, and they're having this wedding, and the two sides never came together. I saw the same thing happen about five years ago at a naming ceremony with a group that I associate with that's very African-centered, in Dadisi, Tanyika, uh, who has made his ascension. That brother was his group. And, but somebody in the family on one of those halves was not into that at all. You know, and so we're still at that point. So that's my antenna has been up about that for a long time. And I think I, I we have families to deal with, and that very often gets in the way. Uh, I think that one of the times that I wounded my mother very much was when I took her to a Kwanzaa celebration. Kwanzaa was new, and she was in town. It was maybe the third one, and I wanted everything to be so right, and it was at the East in Brooklyn. You know, and I said, we're doing potluck. And so my mother got in the kitchen. She did her thing. And it wasn't until we got to the place that I realized she had made something with ham in it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know. And unfortunately, about the time I realized it, another sister went, is this ham? You know, I was like, yes. And, and I, I felt at that moment that I could not rescue my mother. You know, and so for a long time, I paid mental penance for that. So we have these situations that happen to us where the politics get into the everyday. They get into the kitchen, and the spirituality gets into the bedroom, <laughs> you know, and the politics, <laughs> really, you know, and, and we're trying to stumble along with it. So again, I think we have, to, we have to come together and talk about this stuff. We have to talk about, you know, why my boyfriend and I fell out because of so-and-so. 
you know, we, were, we thought we were okay, but then we hit this political issue. I mean, I actually dated once a brother out here. He was into the Asara Sat Society. Mm -hmm. And I was coming out here on my birthday, and that week was a week of silence. And I'm like, look, I'll go with the vegetarian, I'll go with the anchor, but I'm not going with I ain't talking on my birthday. <laughs> okay? Not me. <laughs> End of relationship. You know? <laughs> you know? So it gets very personal. And we, we try to stay up here on this political, you know, nation building level without dealing with what's happening on the personal. And it's the personal that's bringing us down very often, you know, or that's lifting us up and we're not sharing, we're not sharing the lessons and the teaching. I can't tell you how many times I've wished since Mrs. Lagan passed that there was an elder that I really felt I could go to in LA and talk to about some of these, these issues. But I look around and now I am the elder. Right, who am I going to talk to? Yourself. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so sisters are getting together. We're supporting each other. But, you know, they're, they're just things. I see us talking about Africa. Well, in Africa they did this, in Africa they do that. Let's, let's break it down. What part of Africa? You know? Because it may not have been the same in Haile's country as it was in Nigeria. And is it still useful? And who set it up that way in the first place? <laughs> Do all the candles have to be white? <laughs> <laughs> I have a brother here. Yeah, I just wanted to touch. The film really moved me in a lot of, a lot of different ways. And Thank you. One of, the, one of the powerful things for me is, um, one, the notion of how, how present my sisters were in the film, just in terms of setting out the leadership of where we're moving towards as opposed to mm -hmm. where we're leaving. And I feel like this sense of, you know, to me, it's, you know, we, we're couching it in a black and white issue. I think it's ultimately a male and female issue. Mm. I, think it's really, um, I think it's really about one way of constructing the, the world as a dominant way, which to me is a very masculine way of doing things. It's like you do over. And then the women's way that you're talking now about, and even the brother is saying, okay, so let's begin it with the foods because that's a way to sister, you know, I think that's where I heard my sister coming from before is that, you know, it ain't men's way is to cut it in half and say good, bad, you know mm. fat, skinny blonde <laughs> blue right, black, white, and we like mm. to cut things up because we aren't very bright as a species of men, you know, because we can only understand one thing at a time, so we cut everything in half, men on one side <laughs> And that was not planned. I didn't even know that brother was up there. Huh. So, I, so. But the, you know, that sort of bringing, you know, that we need to learn this piece of holding all these pieces together. Even, you know, even, you know, we ourselves are colonists in our own heads. We colonize mm -hmm. ourselves every day. So mm -hmm. let's take care of that business internally. Stop dividing ourselves. Stop treat, treating our women. Let our limbs live. Because we brothers messed it up, you know. So, so let's get behind the sisters and let them teach us how Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> no, before I come to you, my sister, so we're going to end it quickly. But my brother, you know, as you were talking, I was looking back. They have friends up in the back. One is a Barbadian prof you know, filmmaker, professor. And his wife is sitting. She's the one holding the baby. And he's yes. sitting there grinning like he liked what you're describing. Yeah. The man there. And the woman was going like this throughout the event. I'm like watching. She's really communicating. He's just there involved with us. He's not even thinking about, let me touch also. You know, that, yeah. I think that's men and women. This is, they have mm. power from the day one. Yeah. They have really that's that. Cool. And I think, I'll tell you, I will tell you, it's also, it's not paternalism. 
if we're messed up, as far as I'm concerned, if our race is messed up, it goes from women, as far as I'm concerned. Because the headquarter for me is, has always been my mother, has never been my father. And people can tell you lies. We can admire a father or son, but the central thought system of our language, our thinking is taught by women. From the stomach. Even if a, she died after she gave you birth, she has nine months brainwashing on your head, whatever, if it's good or bad. So to me, the thing about this, we forget this whole powerful relationship women have with, with like this creation. And I knew it when my wife was having the baby, I realized I was out of place because she has this constant communications. I'm waiting for them to come out. <laughs> and then they come out, they're still more closer to her. They know her. Yeah. They know when she's mad or sad or sad. They feel it from distance. They know because they had this, this organic relationship that we have not yet quantified. And I agree with you, my brother. I think, to me, you can even tell. I'll tell you. We could do a film and show you our disorientation could be traced if women have given up on us. And for being boys, maybe, we can be men and come to the rights of that. So I still think the center of this whole reorganization is women. The fact she made the film, even if she put us, you know, all the men that I, that I see in this film are very so civilized by yeah. the mother. And so whatever they were saying still had went back to this maternal yeah. answer mm -hmm. to the situation. And I'm not like trying to like, uh, what do you call it? Up, apple? No, no, sister, that's too ugly. I'm talking about, you know, when you, uh, uh, what is it? Um, apple. Uh -huh. No, no, apple, when you sugar coat apple, what do you call it? Sugar coat. What? It's not that, because, because to me it's like it's a very serious issue. I have thought and thought and thought for, always I'm thinking about, even looking at two daughters, and the three, two boys I have and three daughters, and I see basically what is going on, who is for what. And I can see how the boys could be nurtured towards violence easily than the, mm. the girls that I have. And why is mm -hmm. that? So we have to really mm -hmm. go back, without mystifying women, we have to go back to find the answers of some of these communications of acculturating you know, girls and boys. Who acculturate us? Who, who cuts our teeth, you know, and how do we start? And then women, knowing that, what role should they play to, to be a nurturing center of point again, etc. I don't know. But he said it's so nice, and I was just trying to do a filmic thing with that Barbadian <laughs> husband right like there. there. <laughs> he's right there, he's a filmmaker. He's now covering his face. Yeah. Let me, uh, one second, if I may, the, I want one other point, brother. And I don't know what's happening here in D.C., but in L.A., we have a lot of groups that come, African groups that are performing that come to various centers to do concerts. Almost all of them are under management by white companies. And while that's the second thing we need to get to, the first thing has happened is that very often we don't know where they're staying. We don't know who's feeding them. We don't know if they're, you know, what kind of accommodations. If we buy the tickets, we go, we hug them, we go home. Uh, I have a, a friend who is a, a storyteller and choral player. He's now being welcomed by the African community as the first African American to master the Korah. And what he started doing was following some of the dance troops. Where are you staying? And he found out that sometimes they're being put in really bad situations, really bad hotels, C-level, D-level hotels. And so, you know, get a group of people, get them out of there. You know, get them some food. So I'm suggesting, yeah, that you, you know, if you've got a black group coming in from, from another city and they're on tour, Try to be in touch with them. That's another way to address what he was talking about. You know, the bring. The team from LA just came here and they stayed with our family. Oh, the, who did? The, they stayed with the, the, Crump uh, Kings. the Oculto family, the Crump Kings. Okay. The new uh, movie from Rise. The movie Rise. Rise. Ah, so okay. They came here to Good. connect the new dance form that's yeah. really coming out of the West Coast mm -hmm. that uh, parallels our African dance form. It's very clear to me that the ancestors, regardless of what the elders do or don't do, the ancestors are having it and they're taking care of yes. us. Yes, yes. yes. Because yes. those young people, I just see the deities manifesting even when they didn't, even when they they didn't even know when they were, what was yeah, going right. on. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they and in the mm -hmm. movie, the guy says, that's what we've been waiting for all night. We've been waiting for him to get struck. We've been waiting for him to get struck. So we bring it back to 
spirituality of it, that the ancestors are going to take care of us whether we want to be taken care of or, or not. not. But we have, we have to recognize it, right. to accept and receive what, right. what they are saying. Mm -hmm. No, yes. Really I'm sorry, thank you. Go ahead, sister. Going back to house. New meaning. New, new words, new meaning. Yeah, new words, new and meaning. I, I just would like to challenge everyone to, to impregnate your life. You know, impregnate mm. your life. And document, document what's going on in your life because your life itself is important. Mm -hmm. It's your story. And it's a connected story to so much of who we are and who we will become. And so I just like to challenge you with that. And maybe we can get together in that. Are there any burning questions for our sister? We don't want comments. We'll talk about that during the Because you know, the Tom Healy, when before time passed, when uh, there was the the, the first uh, reparations march mm -hmm. here in D.C., we did some things spiritually to make sure that things were going to go peacefully. And one of the things that we did in the Libations and everything at like five o'clock in the morning. But we did, we built an altar in Bethune Park. Of course, what did we, I mean, we had challenges because at the other end is a statue that the emancipated slaves purchased acknowledging what uh, Abraham Lincoln, and you, you, you have him standing up and the slave on the knee thanking yeah. him for breaking the chain. And that's at the other end of the. Um, um. The park. Uh -huh. And it was very painful for us, but when we built that altar, I had contacted Tom and asked him if he would, he said he was coming, if we could use his uh, drawings in the altar, and he brought his originals. Wow. And the wind was blowing, and we had these little paper tents like this for people to put their ancestors' names on, and none of them ever fell over during the whole course yeah. of, of what was going on. And people... Mm. When we tried to break the altar down, people were still coming and putting things there and whatnot. And it mm -hmm. sort of formed like the backbone um, to what was to be done, thanks to my sister, Hugh, who, the, who was in touch with the ancestors when we said, mm -hmm. Linda, come on, we need that. She's a dangerous Yes, I can tell. That's why she got that stick. <laughs> the cane is a deceptive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what she used to grab you with. <laughs> what? Because your daughter is here. Listen, no, you, uh, so you spoke you from your heart, me, sister. You made me cry. Now you want to apologize? You should apologize for making me cry. Maybe that. Uh, Margaret. There was somebody, oh, sister. Well, what, Right. You know, to ask their presence to be here mm -hmm. and whatnot. But it just got up. Everybody got up. Yeah. I just want to make one more comment. Um, I'm so glad that we are, as an African people, beginning to wake up to who we are. We are the dark people of the eye. Without the, without the vision, people perish. Mm -hmm. So as, as long as, I think too many of us have bought into the stuff that said we were less than human, that we were three-fifths. So we've forgotten who we are and whose we are. And I'm glad to see that, you know, it's, that we are having the grassroots beginning to wake up to see, mm -hmm. to remember who we are. 
And I was saying all that junk, the other stuff before to save it, to get around to this point. Okay. And it's exciting that there are other films coming out yeah. in the same venue. And uh, they're there for us. Where's Azza? This has been one of the most exciting discussions. Thank you so much. No, we're going to have to bring her back and start yeah. this riot over again. <laughs> 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 one, one second. One second. Before Azza comes here, first, uh, for me, it's like you just uh, experienced uh, a sister. We are a whole group from LA. This is our sister. And she's always been unconditional to me. And uh, what she did today really surprised me, but I'll tell you what happened. Last week I went to North Carolina and I was trying to catch and you didn't tell us Professor, right, right, right. Uh, Professor Hope Franklin. Mm. He's John. 91. Yes. John. The information I got on Maroons is mind boggling. Oh, wow. mm. So for me, I want you to know those of you who put your money, you putting that money towards my next journey to Louisiana All right. to excavate that whole maroon history of that region. I've got everything. And then another fundraising I need is when I'm ready to go to Texas, Brackettville, Texas, where this maroon descendants live, yeah. Still. telling yeah. stories, yeah. visiting yeah. cemeteries, explaining cemeteries to young people. Because there are many yeah. black people doing so many things, we need to just hook it up together. Right. And I'm going to go to mm -hmm. Mexico. Again, there are black people who left Florida once upon a time, before that left Africa, yeah. run, went through Mexico, through this whole Indian removal territory thing, went to Arkansas, Oklahoma, and escaped again from slavery and all other crazy things that the film will have to bring out into Mexico. And there is, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, this, this black man, John Horse, John Horse, he said, a land before I die for my people was his motto. Every day, from the day he realized when he was about 16, that his African people's dilemma as a kid, linguist in so many languages, he was in the White House translating in this treaty of the Seminole, second, third Seminole War. So I'm saying, my wife and me, and this has started a long time ago, I, when we got married, what I think I said to her was, black people are always ripped off. Yeah. And we don't eat film money. Just to explain, we don't eat film money. If you have bought a tape from me, it has gone to, consider yourselves producers. If you have done, <laughs> you remember we, that dinner mm. we had in the, if you have been right, restaurant right. today. We've been <laughs> arguing. How yeah. do we get black people to be our producers? Here yeah. we are. We don't want that world. We want to be in this world. But who's producing us? And I'm mm -hmm. hit 60 now. You know, mm -hmm. The choice was for me to have a white producer who walked to me. One Jewish guy said to me, and I took Charles Burnett to make him experience when Sankofa was at, uh, at uh, Mike, uh, the Jordan. In Malibu? The, no, oh, the, uh, Michael Jack, Michael. The basketball, uh, yeah, Magic Michael, Johnson's Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson. was big there. A Jewish guy came and said, Phil, give me the movie. Let me make you rich, the richest man ever. I said, I want Charles Burnett to witness this discussion. I know my answers, but I said, <laughs> I brought my friend who does movies here and there in Hollywood and now. We sat together. He's my very close friend. We sat there. I brought the guy, Keshaw, our, our distribution sister there, a few other people. And then I said, tell, him, tell me again what you're proposing. He said to me, I will make this film earn what it should earn. It's not distributed right. I can get you over 50 million for you untouched. I can make, I can make the black congressmen dance in front of the Capitol endorsing your movie. Look what he said. This is a Jewish guy who said this to me. I will make those African American congressmen dance in the front of the Capitol singing Sankofa. Okay? Look how arrogant this proposal is. And of course, I, didn't, I, I wasn't going to give my film. One, it's a very spiritual film. I couldn't market it in those kind of contexts. But I want my friends to, 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 to know, because there are human beings who reject offers. Black people should really know more about people who reject something. Mm -hmm. Because you think everybody could fall for this. This is why I'm like always confused. I think black people should hold their artists with a standard 
That is impeccable, incredible. To me, this is the sister, I'm telling you. I don't think this should be her last film, especially when she's becoming wise now, like hell. We have to support her, we have to do fundraising, we need more chapters. So I don't like it for people to just go home. If you mean what you said, if you meant your presence was real today and your utterance, finance your artists, nurture your artists, do not allow people of integrity be without support. Now I'm grateful, thanks to the Sankofa family, they endorsed, they became Sankofa family, that became all over the world, including South Africa, we created the Sankofa family. Right. It became history. You guys gave me this land what I call liberated territory. We can do anything we want here. I like that. If, even if yes. I don't have money to do the Maroon film now, I may die before I finish it, I still feel contented here. Even when I'm not doing to sit there for me, it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Not waiting in Hollywood for a producer to come out and call me to come in and be on the phone with 20 people and then saying, what, who's your name? What did I say? Come? When did I ask you to come? Uh -huh. Why? You want that? Uh -huh. I sit here. Nodding, saying, at least I'm in an island that's free. And I think for my sister here, we need to support her by long distance. And she's efficiently communicative. And not like me. Some of you send me things, I may never really respond. This sister, say something, she's back at you like that. Like that. So get her email, get her stuff. You know, this, uh, this sister was supposed to do this, but I'm a better salesperson. <laughs> this, okay, this book. You know, those are the, we have it, we have them here. Yes, yes, we have them here. And then I will let Azza oh, break everything. You see why I didn't trust them? <laughs> DVD yeah, and VHS. Wait a minute, go ahead. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, please give your, yourselves a wonderful, big, resounding yes. round of applause. Yes, thank you.